CGI spokesmodels hawk housewares, Indiana Jones meets Mad Max in space, and an accidental phone call warns of nuclear war, or does it? You won't want to miss these 80s sci-fi gems. Between his time playing Luke Skywalker in the original Star Wars trilogy and the sequel trilogy, Mark Hamill's most high-profile role was voicing the Joker for various Batman TV shows and video games. But the actor continued to appear in live-action movies throughout the decades, including another sci-fi film released in the 80s, albeit one that didn't take place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. A small but fervent fanbase sings the praises of 1989's Slipstream, the story of a near-future Earth that has been left a barren wasteland due to pollution and natural disasters, where bounty hunters battle the police for the right to bring criminals to justice. Poison dark. Now drop the gun and we'll talk about getting you the antidote. I never believe a man staring down the barrel of a gun. Hamill once described Slipstream on Twitter as, quote, one of my favorite movies that most people have never seen. If the recommendation of Hamill and his Twitter followers doesn't convince you to check out this underappreciated film, how about the fact that it also stars Bill Paxton, F. Murray Abraham, and Ben Kingsley, and was directed by Tron director Steven Lisberger. 1980's Battle Beyond the Stars is well worth tracking down for fans of sci-fi just by virtue of the names behind it. For starters, it's one of the first films to be written by future Oscar nominee John Sayles. It was only the second movie to be scored by the late James Horner, an Oscar-winning composer whose work includes Aliens, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and Avatar. And the art direction and special effects featured a rising talent by the name of James Cameron, who soon built an entire career out of reinventing the sci-fi genre several times over. Impressive pedigree aside, Battle Beyond the Stars is an ambitious sci-fi fantasy adventure about space cowboys, barbarian armies, and alien clones that both calls back to the campy adventures of the 50s and 60s and also hints at the future of the genre. It was produced by Roger Corman and feels very much like a movie that was produced by Roger Corman. But he is called the king of cult for a reason. He definitely has a knack for creating, or at least attaching himself to movies that are often written off when they're first released, but are much more appreciated when looked back on years later. The new wave slash post punk aesthetic of the 1980s that was most prominent in music, fashion, and hair salons also found itself a compelling bedfellow in sci fi. This was most prominently illustrated in Blade Runner, the movie that informed the cyberpunk subgenre of sci fi for decades to come. But another pioneering cyberpunk film was also released that same year, called Liquid Sky. Unfortunate timing as it was all but guaranteed to be completely swallowed up by Ridley Scott's masterpiece. Still images of Liquid Sky look like an early MTV music video, from the era when bands like Duran Duran, The Human League, and The Cure were in heavy rotation. Sure enough, the movie starts during a new wave fashion show, and among the first characters introduced are rival models Jimmy and Margaret, a doll role played by actor and performance artist Anna Carlyle. It should be noted that Liquid Sky is a very adult movie, and doesn't tread lightly in its depiction of a drug and sex fueled Manhattan that soon finds itself under the influence of a dangerous extraterrestrial being. Are you afraid? But if it seems like a movie you can handle, and you're a fan of Blade Runner and the pop culture zeitgeist it was tapping into, you should definitely seek out Liquid Sky. Few actors ever have a year like Charlie Sheen did in 1986, especially when they're only 21 years old. That was the year that he added Platoon, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Lucas, and a little indie sci-fi movie called The Wraith to his growing filmography. He was only the top billed star in the last one, but unfortunately it's the least remembered of the four. In The Wraith, Sheen plays the titular character, who is both the ghost of a murdered teen and a different kid who's new to town. Sound confusing? Not only would explaining further ruin the movie, but it also doesn't do the admittedly convoluted plot any favors trying to boil it down to a single sentence. Convoluted isn't necessarily bad though, and The Wraith does tell a pretty interesting story with a few surprising twists. But the biggest reason to check it out is that it presents one of the coolest and most underrated anti-heroes of that era sci-fi, not to mention that every scene of the movie absolutely drips with mid-1980s cool especially the awesome version of a Dodge M4S turbo interceptor that the Wraith uses as both transportation and weapon. Intentionally, campy movies tend to rise and fall in popularity as time goes on, but companies like Troma Entertainment and filmmakers like John Carpenter certainly helped to make the 1980s one of the best eras of all time for camp. Campiness, sci-fi, and horror intersected together wonderfully and hilariously in the 1984 extraterrestrial zombie invasion romp Night of the Comet. 
starring Catherine Mary Stewart of Flight of the Navigator, Kelly Maroney of Chopping Mall, and future Star Trek Voyager commander Robert Beltram, the cast members of Night of the Comet are all great choices for the various genres the movie is attempting. The story sees the aftermath of a comet that has vaporized much of the population, leaving only a small number of survivors to contend with the zombies that the comet also inexplicably unleashed. There's nobody! I mean, there's nobody! Arguably, the film's most important pop culture achievement is that it inspired Joss Whedon in part to create the character of Buffy Summers, and it's always worth going back to see the source material for later beloved characters and franchises. Plus, for what it's worth, Night of the Comet is a much better film than the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Michael Crichton doesn't always get the credit he deserves for how important and genre-defying of a sci-fi writer he was. In addition to Jurassic Park, Crichton also wrote the novels The Andromeda Strain, Timeline, Congo, and Sphere. And though not all of them got stellar screen adaptations, it doesn't detract from what an ever-present force he was on both the page and the screen over multiple decades. Crichton sometimes bypassed writing a book altogether, instead writing a story directly for the screen, as he did with his criminally overlooked 1981 film Looker. The sci-fi movie satirizes the control that the media has over people, and in particular, how much influence physical attractiveness can wield. Looker also predicted the mainstream popularity of plastic surgery, as well as the fairly recent phenomenon of computer-generated celebrities and spokespeople. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm the perfect female type, 18 to 25. I'm here to sell for you. In addition, Looker is underappreciated for the way it pioneered the use of computer effects and images in films having the first true CGI character ever used in a movie, as well as using 3D computer shading before Tron did, even though Tron often erroneously gets the credit for doing that first. The movie that the Ice Pirates was most frequently compared to upon its release was Star Wars, and that is certainly valid. But the movie also draws inspiration from Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, Mad Max, and Indiana Jones. It's the kind of movie that both pokes fun at science fiction and the other movies from the genre, while also demonstrating a love and reverence for them. Also featuring early appearances by Ron Perlman and Angelica Houston, the Ice Pirates stars Robert Urich as Jason, who leads the pirates on various intergalactic missions. While silliness is definitely the order of the day, there is a character called the Pimp Robot, for example. The Ice Pirate still takes itself seriously as a production and feels like it had ambitions of being the start of an ongoing franchise. Poor reviews and an underwhelming box office take ensured that those plans didn't come to pass, which is too bad, as it seems like further Ice Pirates movies could have really been something special with a fully formed narrative universe. As it stands, it's a fun little one-off that was among the first to do what earned later productions like Red Dwarf, Spaceballs, Mars Attack, and Galaxy Quest a lot more attention and recognition. The vast majority of the movies on this list got fairly lukewarm reviews at best, and have needed retrospective analysis and a cult following to get their due. Miracle Mile, on the other hand, was pretty strongly praised right from the start, and shouldn't have had to be relegated to the dustbin of cinematic history. But audiences just didn't show up for it, and for one reason or another, it never got that push that VHS rentals and years of TV reruns did for so many of its peers. The premise of the movie, the entirety of which takes place almost in real time within a single night, is that the world has been whipped up into a frenzied panic over an impending nuclear war that will leave Earth a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The twist is that said war might not even be coming, and all of the hysteria surrounding it might not be based on any credible information whatsoever. Indeed, Miracle Mile might have felt current at the time given its proximity to the Cold War and other geopolitical fears of that generation, but it has a renewed prescience thanks to similar panics resulting from questionable news sources. Bonus points for the gorgeous score by Tangerine Dream, and what is arguably a career best performance from Anthony Edwards. Though it was a huge hit in Japan and was, at the time, the most expensive movie ever produced in the country, Fukatsu no Hai, which translates to Day of Resurrection, never got the chance to become the Western crossover success that it could have been. Though a rough cut was screened at the 1980 Cannes Film Festival under the title Virus, it didn't get much attention. Due in those small parts having to contend with Akira Kurosawa's Kagemusha being the toast of the festival that year. It got a VHS release a few years later, but with little fanfare since nobody really knew anything about it. This was surprising considering its international cast that included George Kennedy, Olivia Hussey, and Robert Vaughn, as well as Japanese actor Sonny Chiba, who was fairly well known to American audiences at the time. But American sci-fi fans should rectify this immediately, as Virus is an excellent film that, by all rights, deserves to have had two or three sequels or remakes by this point. Virus tells the story of a man-made virus that is inadvertently released and subsequently causes a massive pandemic, resulting in riots and widespread civil unrest. If I were to open this ampule to the air, 
you would be dead within three days. Fans of more well-known pandemic sci-fi movies like Outbreak, Contagion, 12 Monkeys, and Quarantine should go back and check out Virus. French filmmaker Luc Besson is known to sci-fi fans as a writer and director of both 1997's genre-defining The Fifth Element and 2017's more underrated Valyrian and the City of a Thousand Planets. It turns out that he actually has a third sci-fi movie in his filmography that many people believe to be an overlooked gem, and it was actually his directorial debut. Released in 1983 in his native France, Le Dernier Combat or The Last Battle can easily be enjoyed by anyone, whether they know French or not, as the movie is almost entirely devoid of dialogue. Dialogue. But it's not just some artsy gimmick, as the story of the film is about a post-apocalyptic world where humanity has lost the ability to speak. As such, the characters don't have names, they are simply referred to with labels such as man, brute, and so on. From his very first movie, Besson was already an extremely innovative and self-assured filmmaker, and Le Dernier Combat has aged much better than most film debuts. It's not at all hard to see why he went on to create multiple hidden gem sci-fi movies over the decades.